Um, it's a pity you can't see the first picture, but I won't yet let you wait for it. Uh, it's the Tower of Babel, painted by uh, Breugel. And I would ask, um, the idea was to ask you the question, what do you see here? <laughs> but then you would have seen the Tower of Babel, painted by Breugel in 1530 something. And then I, you would say that's the Tower of Babel, because you all know it. And then I would say, no, it's not the Tower of Babel. It's the progressive jurisdiction trying to build an idea. That's it. Um, and on the picture of Breugel, it's all already demolishing a little bit. It's, you, you can see it doesn't work. And that's the whole problem of good ideas and progress, progressive jurisdictions. Uh, the idea is good, but the, uh, the way it operates is sometimes uh, discuss, uh, uh, um, well, uh, doesn't, it doesn't function too well. And that's the whole problem of labor law. Labor law is a, a employment law, I should say. Employment law is a really great idea. Um, but it operates in a way that everybody tries to circumvent it because it's too complicated. Um, for example, in the Netherlands, we have the obligation to pay uh, wages during illness. And the, I'm being distracted a little bit. And the obligation uh, 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 takes two years. So you have to pay, as you, as you employ somebody who fall, falls ill on any reason, for any reason, you have to pay during two years wages, which is enormous. And especially small and medium enterprises are not able to ensure that kind of um, uh, obligations and therefore they, well, they don't want to employ people anymore, which I can understand. Um, so the problem is, if you have a good idea, you should not take it to, well, bring it to the end, not um, construct it in a way that you are getting it too high. I'm still waiting for the picture and I'm trying to... <laughs> <laughs> well, so you see... Well, the tower believes the tower. And then the next, the next question was, what is the status symbol in Germany? What is the new status symbol in Germany? Who, who's from Germany? Well, I, I see you. You should know. What, what gives status in Germany? It works. So then this is the tower. <laughs> and the question now is, what is the status symbol of the Germans? The new status symbol. It was the car. I, I would say also the car. And, and talking about Uber, I thought that was nice. Everybody would yell the BMW or the Mercedes or even Porsche, something like that. Well, I read in the Die Zeit, which is not the most scientific journal, um, I read this, the status symbol of der Deutsche. You can see on the first place, they said, having enough time. And on the second place, an unbefristeter Arbeitsvertrag. A labor contract, an employment contract for an indefinite period. And why do we have status symbols? Because they are not reachable. reachable. You are not, they're not easy to get. If they're easy to get, it's not a status. And everybody nowadays has a Mercedes, so that doesn't count anymore. But you have to work so hard that you are not able to have any spare time, and therefore time is the first status symbol. And the second one, also very hard to get, because otherwise it wouldn't be placed second, is the employment contract for an indefinite period which I think is, well, symbolic for, the, for the, the way we look to employment relations. They are so hard to obtain, and everybody wants it at the end, because it gives security and it gives a lot of, well, embeddedness in an organization, which we all want. And that is, that is the, 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 the funny thing we see nowadays. We see on one hand that people try to circumvent the employment relationship, the employment contract, and on the, on, the, on, the, on the other hand, want to have it. And you can see it both from the employer and the employee. In the Netherlands, we had a famous case. It was brought to the European Court of Justice. And it's about substitute uh, musicians playing an orchestra. And, well, you can see it quite clearly here. The first lady on the first row is the self-employed one, and the man is the employee or something. But it's really true. In the Netherlands, it's possible to work in an orchestra as a self-employed musician which I think is crazy. The, the, both the, the lawyers of the, the parties litigating in the case, I, I talked to them and, they, and I asked them, well, how, how, how did the proceedings go? What did the judges ask? And they asked, there's no conductor? Of course there's a conductor. But you don't have to follow the conductor? Of course you have to follow the conductor. And you can just play whatever you like? No, of course you cannot play whatever you like. <laughs> so what's the difference between the self-employed and the employee? Well, there is no difference. They do have to play the same piece, of course, in the same tempo, and etc. So the judges were really puzzled, amazed by the idea that it is possible in the Netherlands, according to the Dutch law, to be a work in an orchestra as a self-employed. And I'm too. 
I think it's impossible. And the thing is, if you are a musician in the Netherlands, you work about four hours a week in an orchestra. And the other time, a uh, working day you spent working um, uh, with an, uh, a combo you made by yourself. Uh, uh, you, have some, uh, you give some lessons and you found uh, the, the pupils you, uh, you acquired them yourself. So you are really a self-employed a figure. As a person, you feel yourself self-employed. But in your relationship to the orchestra, you're not self-employed at all. But if you are being self-employed as a, some kind of a identity, it's quite hard to imagine that you, for four hours a week, do have an employment contract, which you have, I think. Well, it's just to, 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 um, to make clear that also the employee doesn't want or doesn't feel like having an employment relationship at all. And that's also stimulated, of course, by tax reduction schemes. In the Netherlands, we have well, a high level of tax reduction schemes for self-employed people. So also, when you are employed, you don't want to be employed as an employee because then you have no tax reduction, so you want to be self-employed, which is financially more profitable. Um, the thing is, the employment contract may be old-fashioned, but still, it is a status symbol, and therefore very uh, desirable. And what is the whole problem? What is the whole point, I think? The point is that people do realize that even though, well, well, when they don't have an employment relationship, an employment contract, they still want to be participating in society. The role of work has changed. It is like the Canadian Supreme Court al al already stated about 40, no, 30 years ago, exactly 30 years ago. And I think this is a beautiful quote, I, so I will read it, out, read it out loud. Work is one of the most fundamental aspects in a person's life, providing the individual with a means of financial support and, as importantly, a contributory role in society. A person's employment is an essential component of his or her of his or her sense of identity, self-worth, and emotional well-being. Accordingly, the, condition in the conditions in which a person works are highly significant in shaping the whole compendium of psychological, emotional, and physical elements of a person's dignity and self-respect. With all due respect, that's very good having the Canadian Supreme Court. You could also have chosen even better a papal encyclical, either Pope Francis or the one before. Well, I'm not religious. That's the whole point. I'm a lawyer. So. <laughs> Oh, well, it's true, but that's what we, what we have seen this morning, uh, talking to the gig workers themselves. And they all said, what's the problem? The problem is we don't have an organization. We, we don't participate into society. We just do some kind of a gig, and then we have to leave again. We are not embedded into society, into some kind of a society. And I think it's, well, I'm not a psychologist, and I'm not religious at all, but I, but I think being part of something is one of the most essential uh, uh, needs of a person. Just participating, just contribute to society. And that's what labor does. So labor is more important than only having an income, which is also important, of course. And the thing is, we know that for ages already. So that's the reason why we invented employment law. Employment law mainly, in my view, has the aim to create sustainable and enduring relationship, I think and not having somebody sent away at the first uh, uh, blow of, of financial or other problems. That's the reason why we invented something like this missile law. And if we do that, you can also see there are some exceptions. Of course, we have, uh, if you compare, which I think is a, a, a difficult and dangerous uh, uh, comparison, to compare uh, labor law with a marriage or employment relationship with a marriage, you can see that also marriages are the preferable whatever, I'm not trying to be normative about this, or a preferable way to, to live together. On the other hand, you have Tinder and you have second love and I don't know what you have, uh, of all kind of say, which is, I think, an exception. And perhaps we should, but I'm not sure, we should think about the way in which we want to form, to, to embed in society labor. And perhaps it's, things are changing. So you can also, also think about short, uh, intermediate uh, relationships between the employee and the employer, whatever you call them, worker, uh, uh, provider. Um, but still, when we didn't, didn't have that debate, we don't have that debate, we should think about an employment relationship as a, a sustainable and enduring relationship, I think. Um, according to European law, this is for certain. I mean, all kind of European directives have the idea that 
the, uh, for example, Directive uh, 1970, uh, yeah, the employment contract for an indefinite period contributes to quality of life. Well, it's not nothing, eh? it's not something just for, for free, or it contributes to the quality of life of the workers concerned and improved performance. So there's more to it, to an employment uh, relationship for an indefinite period than, than only uh, a sustainable relationship. And the question is what's new? All those gig workers, as we have seen this morning also, are doing it primarily to earn an income. And some of them are also doing their jobs in the gig economy just to, to be well off the street, as we say in Dutch, and to, be part, to, to participate, to work, to contribute to society. Um, um, I, I loved the uh, quote of the uh, Uber case, uh, Employment Tribunal London, so much that I also put it in th this slide. If you, who, who has read the case? Because the most beautiful thing is the, the Lady Gertrude, I would say, but, <laughs> for, from Hamlet. Um, now, and you see that there are a lot of, and now I come to comment a little bit on uh, Professor Sachs' um, ideas. Um, the question is, the labor law we invented about 100 years ago had to deal with some kind of the, the same problems we have nowadays. So I called this sheet the old solution for the new problems. Um, if we still think that employment relationships should be sustainable and durable, um, then the employment relationship and the employment contract, employment law, can be the solution to the problems we face nowadays. Of course it can. On the other hand, um, you can do some amendments and then the system would go for another 100 years, perhaps. But the question is whether that's correct or not. Um, there are a lot of new ideas we have to think about. Um, for example, the possibility nowadays to, to uh, detach the work from the organization, which I think is quite new. You always, you always had temporary agency work, of course, and the worker was not working at the office of the employer, but it was working somewhere else, but still he was detached to some kind of a workplace. And nowadays, the, the digital economy makes it possible to detach the worker from the organization at all, so he doesn't have to participate in that organization. As we have seen this morning, it was one of the major problems they, the, the gig workers uh, uh, identified. Um, also, the, 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 the digitalization or the, the platform economy makes it possible to, to have the work done without even knowing the person who's, who, do, who does the work, which also has, well, changes the, the, the nature of work in, in itself, I would say. Um, and it offers the possibility, quite often, to shift the responsibility, to, to, to shift the burden of the responsibility the employer has to carry now to the employee. As you can see, for example, the waiting time is such a beautiful uh, uh, example. At the waiting time, the, 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 some people were complaining about that because they, when they wait, they don't have a uh, commission, and when they don't have a commission, they, don't have, they, they are not being paid. And according to Dutch law, but I think it's quite common, uh, according to Dutch law, um, the, the risk of having, not having work is the risk of the employer, and he has to pay still wages when an employee has to wait uh, for the work. And now you can see that, that that risk is just shifted, is just put on the shoulders of the worker himself or herself. And the possibility to do that was, uh, before the digitalization and the gig economy, was not that uh, enormous. Um, and there's also something challenging about the concept of work in general. I mean, you have a lot of invisible work. It, it has been discussed this morning also, but I'm not sure whether we have, it, have a good idea about it. For example, my, my children are tagging all the time and they type names to photos. And you know nowadays that if you upload your own picture, the system is able to put your name uh, uh, by the picture, uh, uh, to connect your name with the picture because my children have tagged me so much. And the data that children entered into the system, well, it's worth money. But is, are they being paid for it? Of course not. They did it voluntarily, or I don't know what the basis was, why, why they did it, but still they did it. And therefore, you can see that, well, it's work. It, or it used to be work, but it isn't paid. And so you have a lot of those voluntary uh, jobs. In exam for example, in Musea, um, there are a lot of volunteers working well, like professionals, but not being paid because they want to participate in society. And so we have to rethink about work in general, I would say. 
And the digitalization is not the only uh, reason to think about it, but we have to rethink well, the value of work in general. No. Um, and also, that's the last remark I made uh, in, uh, on this slide. I have a lot more to say. Um, the, the digital economy delivers great services. That's the whole point. That's the whole problem. It works. It, it, the prices are going down. Uh, the service is going, is going well, skyrocket high. Um, I don't know who used to use a taxi 10 years ago in Amsterdam or did use a taxi in Amsterdam. I didn't dare to. The drivers were too dangerous. I, I mean, they were, they were really um, uh, criminals, always taking too much money. So and nowadays, thanks to Uber, well, even my daughter uses the taxi now, and I think it's okay. And so that's, that's one of the assets of the digital economy. Um, and, and if we see those assets, it's not something you want to get rid of. Now, what do we do? What do we need to do? And then I come to Professor Sachs. Well, we have to rethink the whole system which we built about 100 years ago regarding the employment relationship and the laws regarding regulating the relationship. And then it's about the concept of subordination, which is the basis of labor law. Subordination is some kind of a concept that doesn't work anymore. Who is subordinated and why are you subordinated? And who is being bossed around by his boss nowadays? We are all professionals knowing what to do, so there's no boss telling you what to do. You know what to do, and that's what you do. And is, th is that, well, does that stand in the way of uh, uh, accepting some kind of subordination? I would, wouldn't say so. On the contrary, just participating in an organization would mean that you're subordinated to that organization, and if that's the fact, then you have an employment relationship. On the, the way the law is not, well, they're taking chairs away now. Uh, it's, I think it's a, some kind of signal that I should speed up a little bit. Um, um, uh, so we have to rethink about, we have to think again about subordination as a system, as a basis uh, uh, for our employment relation, uh, employment regulation for employment laws. And so there are a lot of more things to think about. Professor Sachs mentioned the robot tax, which I think is a, is a very good idea. Uh, if we know that labor is less and less, is becoming less and less important, and is becoming less and less uh, the, the way to, for the state to have some kind of an income, we need to have some other way of, of an income, which must be some kind of tax on capital, and capital is a robot. So we need to invent some other way of taxation. Tax because, on carbon. Uh, on, on? Carbon. Sorry. Oh, possible. Uh, basic income. Why don't we give a basic income to people? Why should everybody participate in society and contribute to society? I don't know. It's just an idea. Um, competition law, Professor Sachs mentioned it already. Co competition law nowadays poses a a, a, an important problem for the unification and, and collective bargaining for self-employed people, and we should do something about it. We, we have some ideas about it. It's well, not the place now to go into detail about it, but it's, it, it is possible to rethink competition law, of course. And I don't think and perhaps I'm insulting some people, but they can um, uh, uh, say that later after, the, after I've finished. Uh, platforms are not able or are not willing, I'm not sure what to, to say about this, to secure the fundamental rights of the workers. They, they, have a contra they, have, they, they don't have an interest. And if they have an interest, it's a commercial interest. And that's fine because we have a capitalist society, but there's someone who needs to enforce the protection we think the workers should have and that some, someone must be some kind of an institution. It can be the state, it's fine with me if the state take that role, but somebody has to do it. It can also be a private organization, I don't care, but then the need is that some kind of an organization is in, in, in installed and being able to enforce the basic rights that we all agree upon, every worker should have. Um, um, and we, we can discuss the, the, the way in which uh, an institution like that should operate. Um, and, and then, of course, that's, well, that's to rethink the value of labor. What do we do for labor? Why do we work? And if a robot can do it, why should we do it? And if we don't do it, why are we not going to build a, a beautiful tower that really works and be happy instead of working on a tower that collapses anyway? So, and on the other hand, well, this was this morning, and I went to... Uh, on the bike to, uh, to the station, and then I saw a lot of posters of Helpling, and 
well, to be happy, I think it would contribute to my life if I had somebody uh, cleaning my house. So, <laughs> well, that's what I had to say. Well, thank you very much for your attention.